Over to you, Jim. Hi, everyone. Jim McNabb is my name. Oceanian is who I work for. We're quite a big company um, that, that works. We've got big offices in Aberdeen, and, but our main office is in Houston in Texas. We do, walk, we do work underwater most of the time, but uh, mainly with machines called ROVs. You'll see them in the uh, video, or you probably saw them yesterday if you tuned in yesterday. But we, we do work in oil rigs and in refineries and power stations and sometimes theme parks like um like the ones in florida and places like that we make we make um like we made the the shark for jaws in one of those theme parks so we make things um but we also do work in in space um and in, in the international space station and this is part of the this is the second part of the video uh, about a, a place called the neutral buoyancy lab that uh, is where you train to be in uh, to, to be able to be an astronaut in space so if you get as sarah says if you get your notebooks and jotters or whatever and write some questions down then the the point is to try and think of some questions that, that we haven't answered that you can ask carol and um, he's one of the astronauts that we're going to be uh, talking to in this video uh, as i say carl's a, f a friend of mine the other guy mike i've met him three or four times as well so i'll to i'll just start straight on to my video just in two seconds sarah did you want it did you want to summarize from yesterday just a quick recap so in the video there's two astronauts one guy called carl and one guy called mike and as jim said they both work at oceaneering and they're doing this filming from the neutral buoyancy lab which is the enormous swimming pool that we saw yesterday that was 40 feet deep and inside that pool is uh, 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 almost like a mock-up of the International Space Station where uh, a lot of the, the uh, questions that we were having yesterday come from. We also had a chance to talk to, to Carl and Mike about how they um, became astronauts. Carl had applied to NASA four times before he was successful and before that they were both in the military and and uh, and were, were, were pilots and uh, they, they flew for um, fighter jets like the F-15 and the F-16, which we were we were talking about yesterday. The neutral buoyancy lab is where they are able to practice before they go up into space, because obviously in space there's there's no gravity, so they use the pool as a place to, to, to practice. And we saw the divers inside the pool yesterday who are there to help the astronauts learn. Um, and, and we were thinking about how funny it was when they drop a tool and the divers um, go down to the bottom and pick it up but that wouldn't be that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be quite happening in space we had a little um, bit of a discussion about food when we were thinking about Carl's favorite meal I don't know if anyone can remember what Carl's favorite meal was that Mike brought up in the space shuttle so that so that Carl could enjoy and I was telling my family about how Carl didn't have a cold drink for ages until the shuttle came up and they were able to to bring with them cold drinks and Carl had a uh, cold lemonade for the first time so we talked a little bit about that yesterday we talked about the um the shuttle going up and docking on the international space station and why the international space station was silver to be able to reflect the heat to keep nice and warm and and, and also we talked about the size of the international space station and you guys will remember those huge solar panels that we saw yesterday that gave them energy um to to allow them to to power everything on the international space station and do all of the work that they did but uh, over to you now jim i think that was the, a, a quick recap of everything we did yesterday Brilliant. Can you see this this chap's face on the on the screen now? We can indeed. You're you're you are broadcasting. Well done. Wonderful. So um this this is uh, this again, this is another Oceanian um um VP for marketing. He's doing the interview and the two guys um you'll see them in two seconds. So what I'll do is just stop the video every now and again and I'll I'll just talk about what you had just seen. And if you can think of some questions, and Sarah will talk about a little bit about it as well. We stop the video in the next 20 minutes. We stop it one, two, three, about 10 times, something like that. So I'll uh, listen carefully, and then we'll talk about it after a couple of minutes. So we have a relationship with NASA. How long have we been working with NASA in, in total and then at this facility? So Oceaneering Space Systems has been working with NASA, I think, since the early 1990s. This facility was opened in 1995, and we Oceaneering have been part of the Raytheon team the entire time it's been in operation here. So we've been working, like I say, close to uh, 20 years. We've had divers and engineers out here at the NBL. How in the world did we get hooked up with NASA to do all of this? So it started because we, as Oceaneering, are a diving company. And the people that are in the water are obviously divers. And there's not that big of a community of divers out there 
that have, I would call it the attention to safety, like that oceaneering can bring to the table. We bring a lot of credibility from a safety point of view, from an operational diving point of view. Um, NASA is always worried about costs, but we have the big company behind us that can bring the expertise at a reasonable cost. And that's the risk trade that NASA has to make. And we've done a good job, I think, providing divers and providing the critical engineers for the unique breathing systems that are out here for uh, NASA customers. So I'm assuming that sometimes we'll have divers in there helping with those operations? Yeah, that's correct. So we Oceaneering can supply divers to that operation over there. And these operations can take place up to five days a week. So we could do training like this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with different companies depending on what the demand is for that type of training. Right now with the downturn in the industry, we're probably doing it only two or three times a week, but it's available five days a week if people want to do that. Okay, so I had the fortunate opportunity to, to, to spend some time in here a couple of weeks ago, at, at, like scouting out the place. And I saw some very, very impressive, I, I guess they're control rooms of some sort upstairs. Um, what, what are those all about? So the control rooms allow people to monitor the testing that's going on in the water. And so for any customer that would come and visit us from outside and want to use this pool, they can bring their engineers here and we can put them up there in the test room. And while they're up there, there's a ton of video cameras that are stationed around the bottom of the pool. And so they can get different angles to look at whatever they're testing. And likewise, we can take that video and we can ship it anywhere in the world real time to somebody that would like to see what's going on in the testing here. So if, say this, your expertise in an area happens to live in London, then you could actually ship the video over there and they could watch the test in real time in order to make corrections or offer inputs to whatever is being tested. And so that's our customer engineers that can actually use the equipment in the room. Exactly, and we think that's a huge benefit. And the other thing that you can do is while you're up there, there's a, a voice system that would allow you to talk and communicate with the ROV operator, or if there happened to be a diver in the uh, water, we can actually talk to the diver in the water as well. And yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so it looks like Oceaneering worked for NASA quite a lot at the at the NBL, at the big swimming pool, the neutral buoyancy lab that's in the background. Um, and because we have safe safe divers and, and, and really clever engineers, can can anybody think about what types of engineer might be might be needed? Um, because some of the, these engineers are, um, are 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 you know easy sometimes to, to employ, but what kind of, do you think they need to study science or do you think they need to study technology or engineering or maths, like the STEM subjects? So the, 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 the point of that a little bit there was to just to show you that um, the engineers of all all, type, all sorts um, can, uh, can, can train in the NBL and become astronauts if they like. We've had two guesses, Jim, for naval engineers, which is very clever, thinking about water. Mm -hmm. um, engineers are, are incredible, I think, because they are problem solvers. So any of the problems that, that, that NASA might have, linking up with you guys at Oceaneering, you've got such a huge number of different types of engineers who can, who can come and solve the, 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 the problems with them and use their, their knowledge. Um, I, I, I think naval engineers is a great guess. Yeah, yeah, this is a brilliant guess. But I mean, there's botanists and there's uh, up in the space stations that, that study plants. There's 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 uh, uh, doctors uh, that you know that study diseases and 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 probably part. I think you said it yesterday, said about the about COVID. I think they maybe have done some experiments up in the space station to to help us solve that problem as well. Yes, you're right, because it's not just engineers that are employed by NASA. There's a huge number of different people. In fact, um, I remember hearing a lovely story about the lady who's the cleaner at NASA, and she says she's the most important person who works at NASA because she keeps everything clean. That allows them to do all of their um, all of their ex experiments in the labs and, and keeps everything, everything working. <laughs> so any job that you can think of in the world, um, NASA probably employs somebody to do that, from cook to... Um, to, to as Jim said, to botanists and doctors and all the different types of engineers 
space scientists have, and people who are studying space and the planets, NASA is, is, uh, employs them. So if, if, if space is something that you love doing, one day you might go and work for NASA. But as Jim was, we were seeing there, they can broadcast all over the world. So you might not even have to move to Houston to work for NASA or move to America. <laughs> you could end up working with the, here in, here, you could stay at home in Scotland and still do work with, with NASA, which yeah. is uh, brilliant. But engineering, it's a great, um, if you love fixing things and problem solving and working as a team and being creative, you should definitely look at engineering engineering as yeah. it's uh it definitely you you you've you've uh, you've enjoyed your time um in in your career in engineering haven't you jim yeah absolutely and if you can if you use a spanner you're halfway there <laughs> find so, a job you love and you'll you'll always you'll always be happy at work yeah yeah i'll just start this again now so and rumor know. has it i'm shifting gears again guys and this is the way my brain works i'm all over the place but i saw an armageddon poster the movie poster out in the hallway tell me about that so part of the movie in Armageddon was actually filmed here at the NBL. So they were going to show that the astronauts were training to do stuff in space. And so they highlighted this facility just like you would for a real mission as where those astronauts were trained to get the job done. So Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck, both of them here? Yes, sir. Did you meet them? No, I wasn't here at the time. Um, that's usually handled by the public affairs people with NASA. So I didn't have the opportunity yeah. to meet them. I met, I met Clint Eastwood. Uh, met Clint Eastwood here. Yeah, he was here for Space Cowboys. So another movie filmed here. Yeah, yeah. So I I was doing uh, egress training uh, from the from the shuttle, and so I came up, shook his hand. I was dripping wet in a in a spacesuit. So wow, amazing. So hold it. Wait a minute. I'll be near seven times, and I never met any movie stars. Um, <laughs> but it looks like the NBL's been in the movies. So. Maybe maybe you should try and get that. One of them's called Armageddon, Armageddon, and the other one's called Space Cowboys that Clint Eastwood was in. So maybe you can, maybe you could get that. Get uh, mums and dads to put that on the telly at some point tonight or tomorrow, and, and see if you can spot the NBL on the movies. Just have to. I can't remember what the rating is on those films. We might have to. We might have to fast forward the bits to um, to do it fast to allow them to to watch it. I think um, the the movie stars but i would love to be able to um to meet some some movie stars at work but uh i'm uh <laughs> that it's nice that they're um that the films are able to use this to recreate some of the um action that they that they do in space yeah yep yep okay so i'm gonna go back to the selfish part <laughs> okay taking off with a rocket strapped to you i mean what's that i can't i can't even imagine what's that what that's like um Tell me, what's it like to, to lift off with that kind of power? Uh, I mean, it's it's an amazing, uh, it's just an amazing experience because you're you're strapped on your back, and uh, you know the and, and they they strap you in a couple hours before you actually launch, and so you have a lot of time to do nothing, uh, and then you know everything starts to happen about five minutes uh, prior to the actual launch, uh, where you turn on the uh, uh, the, the, the space shuttle uh, 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 pressurization systems, the flight controls start to move, you start to, to feel uh, the space shuttle come alive, and then uh, everything really sort of culminates with the lighting of the space shuttle main engines six, seven, six seconds before you launch, and, and so you're there with a million pounds of thrust, not going anywhere, and then at the T minus zero, the uh, the, uh, the space shuttle main engines would like, and boom, you're off off and running, and it's just tremendous amount of shaking, and uh, you know you're going somewhere really fast, and you hope it's to space. I mean, it's got to be just unbelievable. Lots of shaking, I would imagine. I mean, does that not scare the? I'm going to say a bad word. Does that not scare the <laughs> hell out of you? I mean, how does? <laughs> well, like Carl says, you know you're going somewhere, and there's a lot of shaking going on. But you spend all your life training to pay attention to what you're supposed to be paying attention to. But it's a phenomenal accomplishment. I mean, the reason for the launch is to get to this final speed of 17,500 miles per hour, which means that you're traveling at five miles a second. So to put that in perspective, that means you can go from California to New York in just 10 minutes. Um, and we've all been on an airplane where it's taken us, you know, five hours to get across the country. From here to Australia in just 45 minutes, I mean, as opposed to a 24-hour trip. Well, how quickly after you take off do you achieve that sort of speed? You don't achieve that until eight minutes into the flight. So eight minutes in, 
then all of a sudden I can get from New York to LA in how many minutes? In, uh, in 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, and so in order to make that happen, for every pound that you want to put into orbit, you got to have nine pounds of fuel to make that happen. So when you when the shuttle sits on the pad, it weighs 4.5 million pounds. That's the total weight of the solid rocket boosters, the external tank, the shuttle fully loaded. When you finally get into orbit, you weigh about 240,000 pounds. So you got rid of all that weight or you burned all that weight and fuel over eight minutes. And if you work out the numbers, you end up burning fuel at the rate of about a ton a second, actually a little bit more than a ton a second for eight minutes to get to that final speed of 17,500 miles per hour. It's a phenomenal accomplishment. Yeah, so, so when you a couple of questions that you might want to ask Carl on Friday. When when you're when you're launching, it looks like you're you're lying on your back whenever you're you're in the space shuttle when you're launching. So, so uh, could you see? Can you see out the front? Can you see out the windows whenever you're launching? Um, might be a question you want to ask. And the other one is, uh, you, you heard Mike saying that after eight minutes, the shuttle. Um, is is traveling at the speed of 17,500 miles per hour. Um, so what I, what I was wondering was if, if some of you have got some arithmetic whenever you get around to that, guess how long it would take to get the 50 miles from the schools in Fraserborough to the schools in Stonehaven. Can you guess how long it would take to get from Fraserborough to Stonehaven? Or shall I give you the answer? Mm. Oh, I, yesterday, everybody made some guesses. Should we see if there's any guesses to see how long? Someone said 45 seconds. That's one of our guesses. Right. So you're going 17 and a half thousand miles per hour. And 50 and it, miles. It's 50 miles Ish. from Fraserburgh to Stonehaven as the crow flies because we're flying. Nobody took the AWPR. That would take a bit longer. <laughs> I can't imagine they'd let us go on the AWPR at 17.5 thousand miles an hour, but yeah. um, um, we've, we've 25 seconds, 10 seconds, we've had some guesses here. Yeah, well, 10 seconds is the answer. So Congratulations, that's, so Fraserburgh South Park P5M, congratulations, you got that correct. So can you imagine going from Fraserburgh to Stonehaven and it taking 10 seconds? Um, it's uh, it's incredible. So that's the speed that they're going after eight minutes into the flight and i was just um doing some calculations thinking about the amount of fuel that they would have to take to be able to, to they've got to carry on board and to burn a ton per second to get up to that speed so there's a lot going on inside that rocket and and next to the shuttle where they are on the, those those exciting minutes and the question that we'll, we'll ask carl on friday is what was it like to be strapped to that rocket and as jim said you're sort of lying on your back and we'll ask Carl what he can see as they take off. But um sounded yeah. like they were strapped there for quite a while, getting ready to take off. We'll never complain about the delay on an airline uh, when you get on the plane and you wait to take off because they were saying they were stuck there for a few hours. So all good things to, to get us thinking about when we um, when we meet Carl on Friday. Yep, yep, absolutely, Kira. I heard that Oceaneering helped develop, it helped develop, develop the spacesuit, had some participation in developing the spacesuit. Is that right, Carl? You, you, were, you were outside in the spacesuit. So, uh, so we had a contract, uh, it was the Constellation uh, spacesuit, spacesuit system contract. And so we started off uh, developing a suit uh, that could be worn for launch and for reentry, and then also be converted into a suit for walking on the surface of the moon. And over time, uh, that uh, that job changed to developing a suit uh, for microgravity spacewalks. And so we developed a pressure garment uh, similar to what we would train in the pool. Uh, we uh, about a I guess about a year ago, we were testing over at our facility uh, just uh, uh, outside the gate at NASA, and we had a number of uh, test subjects, including myself, that got in the suit and operated under pressure it was a, it was a great accomplishment we also were developing the life support systems and and the uh electrical avionic systems to support that i mean the average oceaneer or maybe it's just me but i'm going to go on a limb and say most people that work at oceaneering don't know we do any of this i mean what other sort of stuff that we do either here or with space systems that the average employee may not know about 
So like Carl said, we've done a lot of work on developing the spacesuit, and I think NASA thinks very highly of Oceaneering and the work that they've done on that. We have another contract that we've had for probably the last, um, since 1995 or so, to develop tools that are used by the astronauts when they're in space. So, it, uh, for example, there's a tool called a pistol grip tool, which is you know, basically a fancy drill, right? But it's got to work in the vacuum of gravity. It's got to work in temperatures that vary from minus 250 to plus 250. It's got to work with a variety of, um, uh, of vectors on the end, if you will, things that you could put on the end of this thing. So we are the, the, the uh, upkeeper, if you will, the sustainer of that type of tool. And any tool that the astronauts use on the International Space Station, Oceaneering Space Systems develops. Um, we also do a lot of thermal work. So we right now build a, what are called thermal curtains that are used on the solid rocket boosters for the shuttle and will be used on the new rocket that NASA is building to protect the hydraulics inside the rocket from the heat that's given off by the uh, the exhaust plume, if you will. So we do a lot of that kind of work amazing. as well. I mean, it's just amazing. Keep going, please. So I'm sorry. Also, just, it's amazing. Yeah, we also do a, a ton of robotic work. Um, so, for example, you may have seen this thing called Robonaut out there. What this is. Yeah, I'm just going to pause it and hand over to Kirsty because that's the that's a Robonaut. This is a little photograph opportunity that I'm I'm, I'm actually showing off here. Um, so if I stop sharing, Kirsty, there. For everybody, this is where we test what we practiced earlier before you guys came on the call. We'll see. Yay, I think it's going to work. Yeah, there is we it, go. That's, has it worked? That's somebody familiar. That's somebody familiar. That That's called, I call that photograph, the robo not meeting a star. <laughs> So, so that's me and the Robo not in Johnson Space Center when I went over there. But it's it's a really it's a really spooky, strange, strange uh, feeling because the Robo nobody works the Robo not. It's almost a, a almost like artificial intelligence. There's no person behind the Robo not uh, operating its hands when it was shaking hands there. So the Robo not looks at me uh, through that helmet and it sees that I'm a person and I stretch my hand out. To shake its hand and the robo not knows that then it processes it and it takes its hand out grabs my hand and shakes it but if i'd have been handing the robo not say a wrench or a hammer or some kind of tool then the robo not would see that process it know it was a hammer and grab it really really tightly um but it knows that because i'm putting my hand out that it doesn't crush my hand in the same way that it would hold a, a tool tightly that it's amazing that it can process the difference between a human hand and a and a and a tool and be able to so it's a it's a it looks like a great workmate but you were just saying so unlike things that we like remote control cars there's nobody with a remote control operating uh robo not it's it's all done and um, the technology is inside so he's a he's a, a fully independent robot that's able to to do different jobs and process information. Yeah, and he's in space just now. He's he's um up in the he's up in the space station just now doing all the the dirty, the dull, and the dangerous tasks. That's what they, they call it, the three Ds. So uh, yeah, Kirsty, you want to um, stop presenting now and we'll carry on? Is that if that's okay? Yes, definitely. Here we go again. Hopefully. There we go. This is humanoid robot, and Oceaneering played a huge part. We probably had 20 or 25 people at one point working on that program. Um, that program is no longer in existence, but what we are working on right now is we're working on a robotic arm that can actually be used in space, and we're working with a company called Made in Space, which does 3D printing of objects in space. And so we're working with them so that someday we're hopeful that we might be able to, for example, print a satellite in space and we will have developed a robotic arm that can be used to do that. Wow. Yeah, just to summarize that 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 little that little two or three minutes. So Ocean Young makes spacesuits as well uh, and, and tools to to be used in the uh, in the space station like drills. Uh, and and the astronauts use these tools to essentially build the space station, and it's 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 all probably roundabout built by now. Um, so, what other kinds of tools do you think uh, would be needed by an astronaut 
in the in, on the space station to to try and fix it and try and put it together. Um, the the other thing they said was a three D printer, um, and that's that's a, an amazing thing. I've I've only seen one of these things once, but they're absolutely amazing. But if they're going to have a three D printer that can make things on the space station, that means they don't that means they don't have to take these things up in the shuttle. So the remember we remember they talked about the weight yeah. of the shuttle and the amount of fuel. If you don't need to take these things up in the shuttle or in the next spacecraft that goes to the space station, then it makes a lot to be making these tools on the space station. What kind of tools do you think they'll be able to make? Well, we said there you needed nine pounds of fuel per pound of, of kit that you were taking up into space. So uh, a 3D printer, and I think lots of schools in Scotland have got 3D printers. They're able to uh, print different objects, but it's this idea of being able to be a little bit more self self sufficient in space. One of the questions we had yesterday um, was um, from Troop House School about how space suits are made. So that's brilliant. The oceaneering we've we've learned today that oceaneering were part of the the development of the of the space suit because it's very similar to being underwater. The divers that you put underwater and the kind of suits that divers wear, it's similar, just a bit more robust, keeping them warm and cold. Um, keeping the right temperature in in space but one of the things there's a big difference between a tool in on earth and a tool in space i know this one jim i wonder if you guys know as well and um, one of the biggest the most amazing things that they've they've been able to do to tools so we've got some guesses some hammers some wrenches some welding tools a screwdriver a drill and um, all of these i definitely think they need in space but what what's what can we do to the tools to make them super useful do you know can you guess where i'm going with this jim no. <laughs> I learned something when I was your age, everybody there, that in space they use magnets so that the tools don't float away. All of the tools are are, are magnetic so that astronauts can just um, attach them to their suit and they would, almost like Velcro, and they, then they would be able to put their drill down by using the magnets on their suit and the magnetic tools and then it stops the tools floating away because even if they pop them inside a tool belt like we use here on earth the the tools would still um float away so using magnets and um yeah they yeah. It, aberdeen years and years ago the toolkit the oceaneering developed for the astronauts to use in space that came to aberdeen and it was an exhibit at offshore europe 20 something years ago and it was an incredibly expensive toolkit about a million pounds um because it had been into space that's how much it was worth but it was basically the same as the toolkit you could have bought um in the supermarket in a way or, or in b and q but it was all magnetic and amazing that that's uh like super super clever whoever came up with that it's a bit like yeah. writing in space using a pencil instead of the the pen yeah. you hear all of these these ways that they were able yeah. to develop new there, things there was another amazing um we're going off tack here a little bit but there's another amazing fact i heard uh, as well from from uh, from talking to carol was that everything in space if you want to if you want to um if you're outside the space station uh, and you want to get in but after you've done a walk or anything to get through the door to get into the space station everything's a turn so there's no any push buttons so so if you if you uh, you don't actually push a button you can't push anything in space and um, because all that would happen is uh, if, if you were an astronaut pushing a button on the outside of the space station because the space station is so big and so massive and has a an awful lot more mass than you then all you do is you push yourself away from the, the space station. You don't push the button in. So you push your whole body away whenever you're touching the button. Um, so most of the stuff in, uh, on the space station is a turn. So it's like you grab and you turn it 90 degrees one way or the other to get to get entry to the space station and most they of the other things. They have to learn that. And Carl was saying yesterday, adapting back to being when he came back to 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 work on earth again he fell over once because he was he was getting acclimatized i think they have to do quite a lot of training to learn how to turn as opposed to that natural instinct to push or or to or to pull so this all of these things that's part of the training that they have to do for years and years to to get good at it but uh, yeah you your school you could start creating your own space toolkit at school with all the tools that you guys have um thing and think about building your own space station and and doing some of the tasks and thinking about what what you would get the robot uh, robonaut to do the dirty the dangerous and what was the the third d jim dull 
the dull like so, me the dull the, the the tasks that they don't want to do but you were saying that the astronauts don't really like the robo not no um, no they've got they've got things called big egos so the the astronauts have got egos to feed in other words why why if i've been training for 20 years to be an astronaut should i go into space and i've trained all my all my years to be able to walk in space and and be able to tell my children and my grandchildren that I, that I walked in space to have a robot do it. So um, I, they didn't like the robo not at all. They gave it bad reports because it couldn't do this and it couldn't do that. But it was merely because they wanted to do the, sp the spacewalks rather than have a robot do it. Yeah, they didn't like the robo not having all the fun, did they? Exactly. Um, but but it's uh, exactly. yeah, it's, uh, it's cool that we. So you've met Robonaut, which is um, which must be one of your highlight memories for sure. Yeah, well, I often I often say that Robonaut met me. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's something I pretend. But but yeah, I have met Robonaut. I could go on for ages about Robonaut, but I'll I'll start the, the 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 tape again. Just and I'll be stopping it in another three minutes. So we'll let you let you listen to this a wee bit more. So we, I'm going to go back to the work side again. We talked about having an ROV here. So is there an ROV pilot on staff that works here, or do we bring him or her in? How does that work? So what we do is we actually bring in the ROV pilots from Morgan City. They come up here. We have set up the control system downstairs with all the things that they would normally have to work an ROV um, offshore, and uh, they come over here. We have a couple of our divers are trained to interface with the ROV and do short test runs, but just more on the maintenance side. But we want the real ROV operators to be here to know the customer, and that's what we do when we bring a job in. I bet there's a fist fight between the ROV pilots as to who gets to come work here, isn't there? <laughs> I would think so. Yeah, I don't know yeah. for sure, though. <laughs> I think they enjoy the, uh, coming up and, yeah, and right. working here in this environment. And how could you, I'm trying to figure out how I can work here. I'm, I'm, I mean, doing everything I can to, to, to suck up to you guys so you can offer me a job here as well. <laughs> Uh, let me get it posted next week. How's that sound? <laughs> okay, so tell me the customers that have been here then and have tested tested some of their equipment. And it's Shell, BP, is that right? Others? Yeah, most of the major customers have been here. Shell, uh, BP, Hess has been here. Um, Exxon. Those, Exxon has been here as well. BP was actually here before we had a resident ROV. We actually brought the ROV in to support BP back in 2012, and they were here for a 22-day test, um, working through their equipment and making sure all the tools were going to work. Um, since then, we've had, I think, three or four um, BP uh, efforts in the pool. Most of them have been three to five days long. So let's say I'm a salesperson, and each day I interact with a Shell, a BP, a Hess, an Exxon. Is there something that I should tell the customers or let the customers know that they may not know about this facility to help sell some of the services that we have here? So we like to, the, the mantra that we have in space flight is to fly like you test and test like you fly. The thought process being, if I do that, then I know my system and I reduce my risk. And that would be what I would try and offer up is if you're getting ready to take a tool out into the ocean and do some work, and you've not had the opportunity to test that tool in the real environment on something I would call like the real equipment, then this facility allows you to work out all the kinks and understand the risk before you actually take it offshore. And hopefully that benefit will save you time. We've had several tests in here where they discovered problems that would have been a showstopper had they gone offshore. Well, it's a lot cheaper and easier to solve the problem here than it is to try and solve it out offshore. Yeah, and especially if there's a catastrophic problem, I mean, God forbid, but still, you could learn that here and exactly. avoid that. So, and so again, is that if I'm talking to a BP or Shell, that that's something that we can we can sell them that service. We can, and in addition, the other thing that we've done is we've lined up the ROV operators that they're going to get out in the ocean can work with the customer here in the NDL. So now that ROV operator is much more familiar with the task, having practiced in it here in the pool, rather than trying to do it for the first time offshore. And the last thing I would point out is. They can apply a lot of resources to a problem here very quickly because we have the ability to use cameras to show what's going on and that video can be piped anywhere in the world to allow Hess or BP or Shell to apply all their resources to try and solve a problem they might undercover, uncover here at the pool. So yeah, so it looks like there's a lot of oil and gas companies use the, the NBL to practice, to practice work that they might be wanting to do 
offshore and underwater, j just like the astronauts need to practice in the pool what they're going to do in the space station. Now, now this is a really the hardest question. Uh, the question I'm going to ask that, that we might want to ask. Um, um, we might want to ask Mike or uh, Carol, should I say, on on Friday? But are you? Can you think of any other dangerous or high risk jobs that the that they could practice in the pool to make it safer when it comes to doing the, the job, the really the actual job itself? This is a really difficult question, but it might be something that you want to ask uh, Carl on Friday. But you could maybe come up with jobs that he hasn't thought about. So this is like a bit of a sales pitch here. Can you think of any jobs that we could do? <laughs> jobs that we can maybe, oh, someone said skyscraper and window cleaner. Um, that's oh, a, that's brilliant. A, they, they, in fact, you think about the number of windows that must be on the International Space Station, <laughs> and you would definitely need to keep those windows clean. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see Earth. That's a great, that's a, um, I wonder, um, horse riding, someone else has written as well, and pilot. So these, these jobs that, uh, at some point in space, can you imagine if we, when we start getting to having space holidays and we need to do our, our horse riding in space, especially without gravity, uh, deep sea diving, uh, uh, having the ability to practice these things in that neutral buoyancy lab in the MBL and so that it becomes auto autopilot and using simulators and things like that. You, This is what I'm saying, Jim. These guys are brilliant, brilliant with, their, with their answers and their yeah, questions. Those are some brilliant answers, washing on the windows. I can't wait to ask Carl about washing windows and horse riding in space on, <laughs> on Friday. Yeah. He'll, uh, it'll definitely we'll get his his uh, little brain cells going. I'm conscious of time, Jim, so I'm not. I'm yeah, a couple of minutes. I, I just keep chatting away, so I'll let I'll let you carry on. Okay, uh, there's another couple of minutes, and I'll come back in. So there's a manufacturing shop here as well. If they need to fix something, can they? Absolutely, they can. They can use that manufacturing shop uh, to uh, fix tools, to make new tools to build structure, say they have to work around something, they can build a mock of, of that uh, of that item, put it down there, so they can really mock up uh, to the greatest extent possible what they're going to see underneath the water. So if they find a problem, I mean, they, they have the, they, you could almost go to the machine shop, fix something, come back, test it again. If it doesn't work until they get it right. Yeah, and you can do that here in this facility rather than trying to work it from offshore. And the last thing I would point out is we are located on an airfield as well. And so if you wanted to fly equipment in or something like that, we can bring it in right through the back door at Ellington Field and put it in the pool with our big 20-ton crane here. I mean, literally, the airport's right out the back right door. Right the back door. Yeah. It says exit. You go 100 yards past that, and you're on Ellington Field. That's awesome. It's got a runway, I mean, a taxiway that brings you right up to the back. Door. So all the, all the testing that they can do here, I mean, it, it's really no different than what you did in the pool. It's it's the It's the very much uh the same uh, method you know we basically have a mock-up of what we're going to work on they put us in the water and we try things out we have the tools if the technique they come up with doesn't work quite right we have the ability to tweak that uh to get it just right so that when we go and do it in space we're 100 percent successful and that's how we were able to build the international space station without any hiccups in the assembly process at all. All these big pieces came together, all the procedures, all the spacewalks, you know, probably a hundred spacewalks to put this thing together. And we had very few hiccups. And and it's up there now, you know, 300 feet wide, 200 feet long, just sailing, uh, sailing overhead every day. Yeah, did you hear how long it was and how wide it was? I think we got that question yesterday. I couldn't quite answer as well. But so the space station is 300 feet long, 200 feet wide. So it's about the same size as a football park, um, something like that. I think um, an American football field is bigger as well, Jim. I think because <laughs> these guys are American. So I think, um, in fact, it's funny, actually, Fraserburgh South Park, P5H, have, have asked about playing football and gymnastics in space um, in the in the chat box. They've written that. And yeah. actually, that's something else. All jokes aside, we should ask Carl what he did in his spare time, what he enjoyed doing when he was up there for six and a half months um, he spent in space. So yeah. if he was a football player, how did he manage to, to, to still do the things that he enjoyed doing? And I remember 
um, lots of children when we met the astronauts before they asked about playing computer games in space and that's like the other kind of things that they do in in space but that uh that 300 foot do you say 300 foot 300 feet long and 200, 200 feet wide, feet wide yeah. doesn't sound like there'd be a lot of room inside for uh, doing any gymnastics or or football but uh we yeah. should we should ask because then um, these are all great questions to them um, maybe maybe they've got a mini football mini football field <laughs> in there but um yeah and there's the, you're absolutely right Sarah and some of the things like can can they can they pick up the phone and phone their wife or phone their children have they got have they got a canteen in there or the is there any bedrooms or is there places to watch the telly and relax i mean uh, those are really t good types of questions to ask, Carol. Definitely, definitely. It's um, I'm I'm conscious of time because I know that everybody finishes. This is our afternoon session today, and yeah. so I think um we're going to have some some schools dropping off um as they go and get your bags and and get ready for the end of the day. Um, uh, we've got um a, a little bit more footage, and then I, I think we'll like there's eight minutes. Okay, okay. I think we'll manage the next block, Jim, but maybe not the last one after that. Okay. Pickups. I'm going back to my part of the interview now. Okay. What have there been issues that you've faced? I mean, uh, not life threatening, but they're like like OSH moments that you've been in space. I mean, have you experienced any of those, and, and how do you handle that? So I've been fortunate that I didn't have any major hiccups when I was in space. Um, on my second flight, um, we were notified once we got into space that during the launch sequence. The uh, solid rocket boosters that come off the shuttle, I'm sure everybody's seen a shuttle launch and watched the solid rocket boosters come off. There's a signal that the shuttle sends to the solid rocket boosters that tells them, hey, it's time to leave. And then they fire these things called pyro bolts, these bolts that have pyrotechnics on them that allow them to explode and come off. And they have a, both an A leg and a B leg that sends a signal to those pyrotechnic bolts. Well, for some reason, the signal didn't get through the A leg, so they came off on the B leg. Now, we didn't notice any difference in the shuttle, but that kind of gets your eyes really wide to know, whoa, I'm glad the backup system worked the way that it did, and I didn't have to do anything about it. But, uh, yeah, that would be the only one that I can think of. How about you? On the space station for six and a half months, everything went flawlessly? No, we were, <laughs> we were early, and so we had lots of odd things happen. Uh, we lost control of the space station, so the space station basically rolled over, and, you know, we had to control the solar arrays manually. Until they were able to, the ground was able to get control, and that was because the space station is a U.S. and Russian collaboration. You know, for a lot of the flight control, when the U.S. lost control, the Russians were able to regain it, and they were able to get us uh, upright again. And so that happened. We had uh, toxic gas um, at, right after one of our spacewalks, and we had to evacuate the U.S. Uh, segment while they scrubbed the atmosphere. We had one of the, uh, we used big uh, gyroscopes, control moment gyros to help steer the attitude. Had one of those die on us. It sounded like, you know, when your washing machine is out of uh, out of balance and it goes, okay, 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 okay. yeah, we, we had one of those too. So it sounded like the, you know, the space station was coming apart. So we, we had some interesting times up there uh, on the space station in six and a half months. When our customers come here, Exxon, Shell, BP, Hess, and they look at this facility, I mean, what do they think? What do they say? What do they, how do they make them feel about oceaneering? Well, the feedback we've gotten is they're obviously very, very impressed with the facility. But the comments that I really cherish that come from our customers is when they compliment us on how well we pay attention to safety. Or, for example, on the most recent BP job, we got a lot of compliments about how well we did lifting ops with the, with the crane. They give us compliments about how responsive we are to their needs, which are all things that we were able to develop as being part of a space program where safety is important, responsiveness is important, mm -hmm. getting things done on time is important. So all that translates over to the customer and the feedback has been very positive. I will yeah, I think that's a nice place just to, to finish there, um, Sarah. Um, one, of the, one of the last questions I was, I was going to say was uh, um, that they might be wanting to ask Carol might be if something serious goes wrong. According to um, uh, Carol, there that things can go very seriously wrong on a space station. So how do they get off it? How do they how do they escape to safety? Do they need to wait in the shuttle to come up to the space station to to take them off? Uh, and you know it's it's like a really 
quite a sensible uh, question to ask them. But I think that's us uh, about done, Sarah. Yeah. I, thank you so much, Jim. And what, so the idea of the last two days was to get everybody warmed up, thinking about your questions. Um, you've heard Carl speak and with Mike Bloomfield, the shuttle commander, who did a few different flights up to the International Space Station. And, um, and so you, Jim's given us a brilliant introduction to space and got us ready to think about the questions to ask Carl on Friday. You guys have um, been brilliant the last two days with your observations and the answers to your to your to the questions that, that Jim has given. And it's been brilliant for us to be able to share uh, this this part of the of the festival with you guys. And then um, we're, we're, we've asked everybody to, to share what they think because it's for us um, we're, we're really keen to keep doing things and do it better and to give you guys what 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 you're looking for but a massive thank you to Jim for for joining us the last two days and remember Jim was the guy who NASA called when they had a problem and and Jim came and helped them out with some of their and um, some of the challenges that he um he was able to share some of his knowledge with them and I think he's done a brilliant job when we called Jim he said yes to us so you're you're like an action an action ghostbuster for us Jim so thank you for for sharing um and until we can all meet Robo not although at Aberdeen Science Centre they've got the Robo Thespian um that is a, a brilliant exhibit so if you haven't been to Aberdeen Science Centre and um, that could be your interaction and you can think of Jim with his robo knot um, and meeting them and doing those those the dull, the dirty, and the dangerous. Dangerous. And um, you think about those three those three jobs. I'm going to go away and try and find a robo knot who can help me do those uh, the housework tasks um, here at home with me. But um, think about the jobs that you guys might like to do one day. Jim loves his job. I love mine. Your teachers love love their jobs, and you can see from Carl and Mike they obviously love their their jobs. So think about the things that you guys like to do every day now, and how you could make uh, make a living doing that. So if you've enjoyed problem solving, if you like the idea of being calm under pressure, like Carl, um, and things going wrong, then then I think you guys will have a, a huge list of things that you might one day want to go and do. But thank you so much for joining us at TechFest. Remember everything that we have. Um, in the last week is available on our YouTube channel. A huge thank you to you and your teachers for signing you up for this session and for making the time to fit us in um, to everything that you've got going on in school. And until we can meet you all again in person, thank you so much for, um, for, for joining us. If you've enjoyed today, please let us know about it and keep us coming with the questions. Um, we'll, we'll, um, and if you haven't signed up to meet Carl on Friday, please get in touch with Jenny. It's not too late um, to, to, to sign up to join us on Friday for their questions and answers with Carl and we'll be able to, to uh, keep keep the fun going for the week but thank you ever so much a massive thank you to Jim I think I've got seven minutes till three o'clock so plenty of time to grab your bags and put your pencils away and uh, and um, grab your water bottles from the day and um, go home and tell the folks at home how much you've liked today and see what they can remember ask them how many pounds of fuel it takes to put a pound of kit in space <laughs> or or think about that uh, that uh, 3d printer and all the things that you guys would print to solve some some problems in space see if they can find space cowboys or armageddon on the telly yes and just ask mom and dad to fast forward the bits or the folks <laughs> at home to fast forward the bits in the movie that we're not allowed to watch until we're a bit older and see if you can find the the neutral buoyancy lab and in uh, in the hydro pool that carl used in in russia so thank you so much jim and for, for for sharing your love and thank you to all your teachers and all of you guys who've joined us today massive thank you and we look forward to seeing you again soon Thanks, Sarah. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.